But if you have the confidence in your own skill sets, you'll figure out where to go when you need to. So prepare yourself, but don't worry about all the little details. They'll come to you. Welcome to episode 227 of the Pathways to Success, where we have conversations with inspiring leaders about their business and keys to success. I'm Julian Placino, your host, and we have another great show in store for you today. It is my pleasure to welcome Jeff Margulies, SVP of Global Solution Consulting at ServiceNow. Jeff, welcome to the Pathways to Success. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's a lot of big names and titles going on there. I'm just a <laughs> humble guy from a little place. It's great to have you here, and we're all very excited to learn more about your background. So kick us off. You are the SVP of Global Solution Consulting at ServiceNow. Tell us all, what is ServiceNow? Ooh, that's always the fun one. Uh, so our founder, uh, ServiceNow, a big software company uh, based out on the West Coast in um, Silicon Valley. Um, oddly enough, we were founded in the San Diego area, which is pretty rare. You don't see a lot of software companies that are in the uh, San Diego area. We've got about 23,000 employees all over the world. And we do, at its core, um, what we call service management. Uh, I was just talking to someone over in the kitchen. They're like, oh, I know ServiceNow. You're like a ticketing company. We are still a ticketing company, we still do that, but I, I love giving a, maybe a quick story of what is ServiceNow, because a lot of people don't really, you know, just think like, oh, I put a ticket in, I get something out. So imagine you're working at a, a really big company, let's pick one here on the tollway as an example, like Mary Kay as an example, who is a big customer of ours, and you're an employee there and you have a life-changing event, a really good one, you have a child. Then you gotta go figure out, never mind where to put the kid and the diapers and all that kind of crazy fun stuff, don't get to sleep and all those things. But from a work perspective, you need to change your benefits. Well, in big companies, it's actually pretty hard. Next, you know, you're on some intranet and they have 28 different things you gotta go do in some PDF form and nine phone numbers and all these companies. Well, when you take our software and apply it to that, because in, in the core, we're a workflow automation company, we workflow it. So we say, oh, you had a baby? Click, let's start that. Here's the 28 things and it sets up tasks for you and it integrates with applications, people, system, process to make these things smoother and better. You know, we like to say we make the you know, work lives better is one of our taglines and that's a, a good example. That's not just so IT based like a lot of people know what we're famous for. So more than just a ticketing system, a true full end to end solution. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. So SVP of Global Solution Consulting, how do you focus your efforts? What do you own for the company? Oh, own is a tough one. So uh, Global Solution Consulting, in a more traditional sense, we're a, a pre-sales organization. So um, you know, I'm sure there's some kind of sales people here in the room, but we like to make fun of them a little bit. So we'll, we'll have a little fun at their expense today. Listen, you need salespeople. Don't ever think that you're not gonna be able to survive in this world, at least in the software business without salespeople. But um, um, some of my best friends are salespeople and I'm very respectful of them, but they don't know what the hell our software does. And so I have the team that knows what the software does. More so, we can go into a customer, and you, you said some great words at the beginning. I heard the word discover. That's one of the big skill sets that my team has. We have to come in and we don't just assume they even know what our software does. In fact, we kind of don't care. We want to go and discover what problems do they have that we can hopefully go and solve. And we try to craft a solution to them. We don't go build the whole thing up, but we give them the vision of what it might be and then showcase the benefits of what it's going to have. Like that employee example I gave, and we can apply it in many, many different ways. So that's what my team does. We do discovery. We, do, we actually will do the solutioning. We'll do solution fit, et cetera. We'll even help with the business value assessments. You name it. We don't close deals. That's what you need salespeople for. They're the ones that are really good at reaching into that back pocket and pulling those dollars out. Someone's got to go do that. And that is a nuance between pre-sales and sales. I appreciate Correct. you unpacking that. So. Yep. so before we go into your background and learn more about your story, what else do you think is worth mentioning? What else should we know about ServiceNow? Ah, you know, we're, we're an interesting company in that, uh, you know, this year we, we probably get to about $9 billion in revenue. And, the, you know, never mind, there's lots of big companies doing lots of big revenue. But a unique thing for us is that 
Uh, never mind, we've stayed relatively close to our roots. We've done it through no acquisitions. We've acquired companies, so don't confuse the two. But if you go and look at some of the bigger companies out there, Salesforce is a good example. And it's not a good or a bad thing, by the way. They've acquired a lot of very large companies. Essentially, they've acquired revenue. We have done none of that. We have done it all from an organic growth perspective. Um, I'm on my ninth year here at the company. And when I started, uh, I was employed around 2,000. And this year, like I said, we'll eclipse 23,000. Um, so that's in just a nine-year time frame. So, you know, I, I think we are relatively unique. And then, of course, if you think of technology today, because I know we've got a lot of technologists, especially here in the room and probably some of your audience, you know, the, the, the hottest thing, you can't go a day, I can barely go an hour without talking about generative AI and how it's affecting both, you know, the, the world in the chat GPT sense, but from an enterprise software perspective, you know, it's dramatically changing things. If you, if you ask me or you ask broadly across ServiceNow a year ago, well, what are you doing with Gen AI? They'd have been like, what is Gen AI? Like, you, you, you barely would have gotten an answer. And we flipped to that, from, from that to um, it's our leading sales cycle today. We're trying to inject it all over um, our software today, talk to our customers, et cetera. And, and I truly believe that we are on the cusp of a big change. You know, I'm, I'm old, as you kind of heard Collins mention a little bit beforehand. Uh, he and I were slinging code back in the mid-90s. And that was when the shift from mainframe to the PC desktop arenas or client server had come around. I luckily got through the whole internet.com bust and boom and all those kinds of things. And then I'd say the move to the cloud is probably the uh, cloud and then mobile, which all kind of came at the same time. And I think generative AI, AI is sitting in that kind of same space. And it is exciting to kind of be around it. And I, I do believe from an enterprise software perspective versus the infrastructure companies like Amazon or Microsoft, et cetera, um, you know, we're probably one of the leading ones out there because we actually have a shipping product. So that's a big deal. So a lot of cool things to come. Okay. Awesome. Well, Jeff, let's unpack a little bit about your story because one of the big highlights that I gained after our initial conversation, and I will quote some words from you here, and that you grew up as a blue collar kid in the plains of Canada. Yep. And now you're running a team of 2,300 for a multi-billion dollar corporation. So I want to start to begin to figure out what were some of those key experiences and milestones that allowed you to do what it is you're doing now. So give us a bit of an origin story. What was it like growing up in Canada? It's very cold. <laughs> Crazy cold. Uh, I mean, it's cold beyond. It's like, uh, considered like fifth coldest city in the world. I'm from a place called Winnipeg in Manitoba. Uh, if you ever think of you never want to go like North Dakota. I'm from 200 miles north of North Dakota. <laughs> There's not a lot there. Uh, they still do have a hockey team. I don't follow them. I'm now a big Dallas Stars fan. Um, but uh, the Winnipeg Jets are still there. But you know, it, it, it did ground me in the realities of what goes on around you. You had to work pretty hard to come out of a place like that. Um, you know, I come from, as you mentioned, uh, a more blue collar sense. My, my dad worked in a slaughterhouse, slaughtering 400 hogs a day and cutting them up. That taught me pretty quickly, I don't want to go do that. He used to take me on the weekends to show me, and I think that was the reason to say, listen, I'm doing this, and that's fine, but you don't want to go and do this um, for a living. And you know, I was lucky uh, um, back in the early 80s as computers were just coming around, and um, I started playing video games like most you know, teenagers, especially nowadays, they do tons of it. But that was in the, the Renaissance eras of video games. My Atari 2600 was... Fantastic! I love that thing. My brother and I would break those joysticks like every three months. If you've ever seen one of those joysticks, they're actually plastic and they used to break all the time. Um, but you know, that kind of got me on the path of being in the technology, the computer space, and I got my first computer probably in the 1983-84 time frame. Um, my, my best friends all had Apple IIe's. That's probably way before anybody's time frame here. I got a beautiful Commodore VIC-20. It barely could do anything, but it made me want to code, and I loved coding. And that's kind of what started, I think, the path for me to move to somewhere where I'm at today. Interesting. So what was it about coding that you loved or found interesting? I, to me, it was like puzzles. Like I always was a math guy, and it was pretty interesting, but it was like... To me, it's, coding in general is a puzzle. You, you do some discovery, of course. You've got to do that piece and kind of figure out where you want to head. And then it's like, OK, I know where we're at here. I know there's some kind of destination, an outcome for some user that you want to get after. 
you have to go and figure out how to build the thing in the middle. To me, that's like building a puzzle. That's a very complicated one at times. And you had all these languages and all these routines and all the things that sit in the middle. But it was, to me, just like building a puzzle. And so I, I loved doing it. And I was, you know, especially back then, you didn't have like the things you have today. You get you got Code Geek and the, you know, sitting next to 7-Eleven nowadays. They, they didn't have that back in the 80s, right? You had to do a lot of self-study. And uh, there was no internet. You know, it was finding things from your friends, school, et cetera. But I, I right place, right time with some of that stuff. And it really kind of got me going in the, the technology space. So I heard it was kind of at first an interest in, in video games and computers, and it was just like a fun thing. But ultimately, it led you to the discipline of coding, yep. and you saw coding as a means to solve problems. And that's what began to inspire your career in technology, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, and I'm, I'm pretty competitive, too. And I know this might sound a little weird, but like I'd get into, especially when I started more in the work environments, and, and Collins was great for this as well, was that he drove me, he was a really good coder, was a good coder, he's not one anymore. Don't, don't let him fully into thinking that, that he's actually technical. He's as technical as I am, if I had to guess. But you know, sitting next to Collins, who was really good at doing that, his architectural mind and data analytics skills were some of the best I'd seen. I was like, I can't let him be better than me. And it wasn't I needed to beat him. I never was like that, but I was like, I can be better at doing this stuff because I'm seeing other people do that. And so maybe even there's a little bit of sage advice is get, get yourself surrounded by people that are actually better than you. For me, it re due to my competitive nature, and, and it wasn't a zero-sum game that they had to lose. I just wanted to win maybe a slight bit more than they did. And, and it really drove me to, to be a better you know, programmer, at least at the time. So it sounds like you and Collins actually inspired each other and kind of influenced each other's careers. Then. We've never really talked about that, but probably there was some of that, at least for me. I don't, I don't know about okay. that. <laughs> right on. So pretty early in your career, so you started off as a tech guy, but eventually you became a manager and leader, et cetera, right? Yep. And an insight that you gained early on, or a shift that you made, was being that puzzle solver to a people problem solver. What caused that shift early in your career? You know, I did find, and you probably see some of this today, you, you know, technical people love to kind of work on a spec sheet and, you know, solve the problems, but they don't, they don't really see that end side, like, what do people actually do with this stuff? And I was always interested in both of them, and, and that's I, I, it, part of the reasons I had some pretty good advancing in my career was the fact that I didn't just focus on, well, let's just do all the coding and not worry about what happens with it. I was always curious, well, what do the users think? Because I was finding quickly, um, you know what? Whoever had gone and done the discovery and the requirements gathering, they don't really understand the users. And I wanted to hear it directly as a coder. And so I would spend my time more so, as time moved on, finding out like what are the real problems. And I'd go and sit with the people that are sitting out there. And I was like, ooh, I really like doing this side of it. And so it gave me that, that mix of business to technical that was going on. And then I think where, where you're kind of heading is that I also found, and, and this is also something that, that Collins and I were doing a lot of, is that you can do all the coding, but and you realize, like, hey, if you're pretty good at doing it, getting everybody else to be as good as you is hard. I don't know the solutions to doing that, by the way. But um, you know, doing the architectural sides and doing some leadership around it, because there is sometimes that lack of the, you know, I'll use a persona from today. I don't know if this is going to resonate initially, but that Elon Musk type thing, like, I want to really be led by people like that. Or maybe you don't, right? Depends on your, you know, philosophies, et cetera. But I think tech people want to kind of see that in themselves. Someone that's like, oh, no, I'm technical, but I can do some of this business skill thing and, and that people side of thing. And they're like, oh. I'm really attracted to doing that, and you kind of get you know, better at leading people like that. So I just kind of naturally fell into it. I didn't have a career plan that was like, I want to be a manager by 29 years old with these 12 people under me. I could care less. I was like, I want to code. But found other things that made interest to so me. So to me, it sounds like in the beginning of your career, you fell in love with the agency. And, but pretty early on after that, you found out you really love the outcomes. How is this affecting and solving business problems? And that's where you spent growing in the majority of your career. Yep. Okay. Yep. Awesome. So I want to jump into keys to success here, but I first want to talk about an insight you shared with me that I've always known that was inherently true, but I've never heard language describe it before. And the advice that you had for all persons, despite your discipline, 
is to become endearing to sales. What does that mean, and why should everyone here in this room care about that? Well, we'll, we'll do there. There's actually two of them, so I'm going to do both of them if that's okay. Sure. Um, and and it's you know, I, I I lead a pretty large team, and I talk to our, our industry in the pre-sales world and the tech world in general, and and. I have sort of two things that I always bring up to people, regardless of the level, where they're at, et cetera. And it's one is be known for something. And then the other one is to, if you're going to be in the, especially the sales world, and, and you all are in the sales world, if you don't realize it, by the way, I don't care what you do here. Someone's got to go help sell this stuff, and all of you can help do it. And that's be endearing to sales. Because that, that's a hard job. I always so start with that for a second, then I'll go back to the be known for something. So from a sales perspective, it's never lost on me that Sales reps get fired when they don't sell anything. You all probably are a lot of the consultant technologists here. We don't fire you when we don't sell something. Maybe at some point you might have you know, uh, um, implementation challenges, et cetera. But like in our business, uh, you know, sales reps miss quota three quarters in a row. It's a quick handshake and here's the door. It's a sales-based environment. If you're not selling anything, there's no point in being here. And so I always think of that and go like, you know what? I can't do a salesperson's job. I am not good at contract negotiation and actually extracting the money out of an entity. And I feel for them. So anything that I can do to make their jobs better, it's going to benefit me anyway. So why don't I help that with that? So in be endearing to sales. And then that, that may be kind of to that first part is the be known for something. You know, and this is more, I think, broad career advice. A lot of people kind of they go like, oh, I want to get advancement. I want to do different things. I want to be a leader. I want to be an architect, whatever you might you know, aspire to. Well, be known for something. It doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't mean need to be on the billboard on the tollway. It doesn't need to be on LinkedIn for that matter. Feel free. Everybody posts stuff up on there. right? But be kind of known for something. So maybe a, a quick story, if, if that's OK. Um, it was back in probably 2003, 2004 time frame. I had just joined uh, VMware, which was a really small company at the time. We had 400 employees. Uh, they just got bought last week by Broadcom. They don't exist as an entity, but they finished off at like 36,000 employees. So I was there right when it was that true founding renaissance of the company. And I was, I was uh, managing a very small pre-sales team of four people in the whole central United States. And I was trying to learn the product. I was, all, I was a mix of team leader and manager at the same time. So I had to be technical and do some leadership. And so I'm, I'm running around trying to learn everything. I'm trying to do sales calls all over the central US. And oddly enough, but the best sales rep that we had in the whole company was here in the Dallas area. So it was lucky I live here and I get to see him a little bit more. And I was like, I want to learn from this guy. Like, why is he so successful? And I did some ride-alongs with him and I realized quickly like, hey, what's this sheet you're using? And what he would do is he would pull out this, he was so funny, he loved, he's very particular, he laminated this Excel spreadsheet. It was a piece of paper, but it was an Excel spreadsheet underneath. And after we would talk to the customer about the value proposition, what we had, what it did, how it worked, et cetera, he would pull this laminated sheet out and with a marker on there, be like, well, how many servers do you have? Oh, 12, okay, and how many this and how many that? And he would build a value proposition right in front of the customer and show them, never mind all these great benefits, but here's how much money you're gonna save. And the customers were like, can I get a, and back then, can I get a photocopy of it? You take a picture of it today, but back then you took a photocopy, like, yeah. And we would sell, he was selling like twice as much as anybody. So we do a call and I'm like, David, can I, his name's David. I'm like, David, can I see your sheet? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, man, this is pretty good. I said, but did you make this? He said, yeah. And I was like, well, it's actually wrong. Like you need a technical guy, that's me, right? To actually fix this up a little bit. The way you're configuring stuff is a little off. And I was like, can I fix it? And he goes, heck yeah. He goes, I don't know, I just made it up one day from a customer. <laughs> so I kind of fixed it up. We relaminated it, just to be clear. <laughs> and then I, but I said, if you don't mind, I'm going to go and share this with the four other teams. So I started traveling to, to Denver and Kansas City and St. Louis and Salt Lake City. That was our um, patch at the time. And I'd go do a call. And at the end, I would tell the sales guys, hey, if it's OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the sheet out. And they're like, ooh, uh, you're a your tech guy. I'm like, it's OK, I got this one. And I'd pull it out and I'd go through it with the customer and we'd show them. All of a sudden, the whole region is starting to do really well. So back to the be known for something, it's kind of a technical thing and then I, someone had to configure this stuff. But I got known for working with the sales teams to help us sell more. So by the way, I covered both of those. 
I was known for that, and it was endearing to sales at the same time. We finished the number one region, you know, that year. Went to Hawaii, did all that kind of fun stuff, and it really did help, you know, with the trajectory of my own career doing that. But anyway, there's a. So then, further make the case, fill in the blank, okay? So, if you are endearing to sales, regardless of your discipline, you will experience or achieve what? Well, I think both, uh, I mean, again, it depends a little bit on the companies, but I, I think, you know, this one and the kind of software companies that I have worked at and I'm in around constantly, you know, in, in software companies, a great thing we always say, you're either building the products or you're selling the products. It's A or B. There's actually no, we do nothing else. You don't exist really for any other region, so, or for any other reason, pardon me. So being endearing to sales can only help with the value propositions that you give to both the customer. Because again, salespeople sometimes, they can get a little off kilter somewhat of how or why a customer is buying something. And I do believe the kind of roles that we all have, and we're all relatively similar, can really help with some of that. So being endearing to them so they'll actually listen to you a little bit. Who hasn't had a sales rep go, yeah, yeah, hey, tech, tech person, listen, just, just go sling some code. I don't, I don't worry about what we're doing over here. I'm like, uh, hang on a second. I know this stuff, but I don't know the sales environment. There's a nice place to live in the middle, and I can really help with these things. And I love living in the middle of both. And some days, like yesterday, I did a ton of deep tech stuff. We had some training, we did some Gen AI stuff. But next week, I got to do a bunch of forecast calls and talk about what's the value props of these big deals we're working on. Working in both spaces is fun. And so being endearing to sales allows you to still be technical, yet work with both sides. And what is the selfish benefit to the individual who implements that philosophy? Yeah, I mean, it's not always going to work, but I do believe there's some career advancement going on with that. And again, coupled with the be known for something piece, I think can really help, right? Again, I believe in general, you're either building or you're selling and there's only one or the other. And by the way, I know like at our own company, we even bring our actual product engineers out in front of the customers because it can help us to sell the product sets. So I think that can happen everywhere. Gotcha. Okay. And to me, it actually seems like your entire team is that mm -hmm. because they're the technical people that help the people sell. Yep. And an entire division was created because of that reason. Yep. Yep. Okay, That's cool. True. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the, back in the 90s, it, it was a, uh, wasn't even a career of sorts. It wasn't until the renaissance of true enterprise software sales came around that these roles, you know, really started. And now there's, it's a, you know, huge uh, profession sitting out there. Gotcha. And okay. it's very common, uh, by the way, we <clears throat> as a company and my, my team, uh, we'll hire a lot of what we call practitioners. We're not always looking for career SEs, right? We'll take those as well, but we cut often we'll go into our customer base and be like, you know, you know our stuff really well and you don't realize it, but if you're a platform owner of our software or really any of the big companies sitting out there, you're selling internally all the time. Hey, I got this great idea. If you fund this thing, I'll save you money. We'll make more money. We'll make lives better, et cetera. Well, you're selling. We're just going to formalize it for you and put it in a software company. And I carry a quota just like everybody else does. My entire team carries quotas, yeah. right? Uh, which for a lot of tech people is very daunting at the beginning of carrying a quota, right? But you get used to it when you get the good checks, so. Gotcha, okay. So Jeff, I want to close with your keys to success and specifically your six lessons to becoming an authentic leader. And this is actually a LinkedIn article that Jeff created and it generated, I think, hundreds of thousands of views. So you all get to get the real life version and interaction of this. So there's a tremendous amount of wisdom in what he's going to be able to share right now. So let's start with lesson one. You might not know the end game, but things have a tendency to work themselves out. What does that mean? Well, you know, I, I, some people kind of sit and like consternate over like all these different things. You can you, you basic paralysis analysis type of uh, uh, strategy there. I think it's good to prepare yourself you know, to, to understand where you're heading, but you don't have to know everything. I, maybe it can border for me personally on cockiness, right? And that balance of arrogance and cockiness to confidence is a, is a fine line, but I always kind of believe if you have the confidence in your own skill sets, you'll figure out where to go when you need to. So prepare yourself, but don't worry about all the little details. They'll come to you. What is the best advice that you can give for the characteristic over analyzer? What is a discernment process that we could go through to get prepared enough to make a decision and take action? 
Well, I think he, by the way, I think you could do it on both ends. There are people, and I probably am more, more on this front, they're like, yeah, I'm not going to prepare anything. I'm just going to show up and just find out what happens, right? I'm a roll the dice um, type person, so I'm not an over-prepare, all right? I, I wouldn't recommend that for everybody necessarily. I think that depends on your personalities. But, you know, on the, the side that you're looking at, again, I think it's important to, you know, know your own skill sets, know where you're kind of heading, but don't over-prepare with that stuff because, then you, for one, you spend a lot of time and you may never use some of these things. And second, you might be so bought in on a certain path. Well, especially in the worlds that we all live in, who rarely follows the path that you think you're going to go on? It might twist and turn. And if you're not comfortable with that, ugh, you know, it's going to show up really quickly because you're going to try to stick to an agenda, yet the agenda has been blown. Who hasn't had to deal with that, right? I mean, and that's a good skill set to kind of learn as time goes on. Yeah, and I think also it's helpful to look at your past because I'm sure if you have had that experience in the present moment, you sure have had that in the past. And despite the actions that you took, you're still alive and you are still able to continue down your path. And just like Steve Jobs' incredible quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them backwards, but you have to trust that they will somehow align. I think there's a tremendous amount of wisdom in that. The second is any experience is good experience. What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, you see this more and I would say a bit of our younger generation. They, they, they have a tendency to want to plan out their entire futures without actually starting them. And so, you know, like one of the things that's in the article that I, I, I wrote, which talks about, it was actually one of our, we, we do a lot of early in career, you know, I'm hiring and then we train and eventually they become professional SEs. And I was mentoring a, a very, very young SE at the time and she just, She's like, oh, I got all these career opportunities and I don't know where to go. And she's like, just analyzing like crazy. And I'm like, you don't understand. You're working at one of the best software companies in the world. You're in the tech business. You're technical and you have a bit of sales experience. You can't screw this up. Pick A or B. Yeah, you'll figure out which one's a little bit better. You actually can't get them wrong. Like, go get the experience to stop worrying about every little thing to get it just right. Like, just go have the experience without worrying about which one might be better. I, I see that especially in our, in our younger generation. There's this over-preparedness uh, that they want to do with their lives. I'm like, just go out and try them. You, yeah, I promise you can't get them wrong. So give some advice to the person that's currently in a job or performing a task that they don't like, that they hate and it's hard for them to see that this is good experience they can't see, what would you tell that person? Yeah, go try something different. And it doesn't mean go get another job tomorrow. You, you could do that too, right? Uh, I'll, I'll use a quick one even right now uh, personally. All right? it, I'm not trying to go do something different in my career. I'm way too, too late down that path. But a perfect example is as generative AI started entering into the fold within our own software company, I hadn't really done a lot of deep tech stuff in a while within ServiceNet. I'd lost my way and done too much boardroom crap, to be honest with you. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go learn it. Like, learn it for real. I went, I went online, started watching some video on YouTube and LinkedIn. You know, you can gather all kinds of data these days. Go to ChatGPT. It'll teach itself, right? And I was like, huh, so that's what this is. Then I started teaching myself, well, what are we doing with it? And now I'm all of a sudden, which was never the intended case, but I'm like one of our experts of sorts for Jenny I across our company. I mean, I've done briefings all over the world on what we're doing at a very deep tech level at the highest levels of some of the biggest brand name companies. And that's not, that's not meant to, to advertise this stuff, but to showcase, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you can learn those new skills. And by the way, nobody told me to go do that. I did that on my, you know, on my own dime and my own time. Right? I was like, I think this is just something I'm interested in. I want to get into it. I think it'll head somewhere. I didn't, didn't know. But it, and, and it, you know, I'm lucky that it's kind of working out that way. But I do think just have some, some grit and gumption to go and try some different things. And it sounded like you followed an interest or curiosity that you had that it could become relevant in your craft. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Always be curious. I love that. And it allowed you, know? you to sort of refresh your lens of how you see what it is that you're doing. Yeah, I think that's exactly. Great By the way, now my own team, they're kind of funny because like, oh, you're pretty technical with that stuff. And I'm like, well, I was technical, but I just, you know, hadn't showcased a lot of it lately. So it sounds like any good experience is good experience if you change the way you view it and take action. Mm -hmm. The onus is on you. Okay. Yeah. So the third one is be confident and not cocky. 
What's the difference? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I kind of mentioned that a little bit already, but, you know, walking those fine lines of that, of having some self-confidence to, to walk in and say, well, no, I, I know this product set. I know this code set. I know this problem. Um, you you want to do that in a way that's, you know, confident that I, I'm here as a relative expert. A lot of you are probably as an example in the consulting space and customers don't want to pay you um, for your services if they don't feel like they're really getting value on those. But you could also seem quickly overconfident or cocky when you're doing that. And so having a grounded values on that, I, I, I always try to be, you know, humble from it, but then use those discovery skill sets to draw out information and they go, okay, now that I've kind of heard enough, well, here's, you know, most people, they do want your opinions. So give it in a, you know, clear, concise manner. And I think, you know, you can come off most times, I would hope, uh, confident, but not cocky. But it, it, is a, it is a tough line. And I, I learned that one from uh, um, a, an old leader um, colleague of mine who's now actually the CEO of Workday. He used to say that to us all the time. He was my sales director back in 2005. So I've known him forever, and his name's Carl Eschenbach. And he always had sage advice around those kinds of things. And, and if you meet him, uh, he's the kind of guy, if it was today, he would be an American Ninja Warrior. He was like that kind of like, just, you know, really like this and bold. But he was super humble when you met him. So he could be that confident style with a level of humbleness. Uh, hard, very hard to do, in my opinion. So for anyone that may deal with any kind of insecurity at any level, what have you found that grows genuine, humble confidence? I don't, I don't know that initially it grows. I mean, see other people do it. There's a perfect example I just gave you right there. I saw someone who's now, you know, one of the foremost uh, CEOs in the world these days. Uh, and I've been lucky to be around quite a, quite a few of them. Actually, if you don't mind, even quick story. Because you mentioned servant leadership kind of at the front. Um, at, at ServiceNow, about four years ago, our CEO was a guy named John Donahoe. And that was what he constantly used to preach to us. In a, in a very positive way of servant leadership. John Donahoe now is the CEO of Nike. So, I mean, he's running this huge $100 billion company. And if you met him, he, he would remember your name. He would shake your hand. He, he would look you in the eye. He'd be actually interested in you. And I think, you know, that helps to create a bit of humbleness. Just be grounded in everything. We're all just normal people. We all put our pants on the same kind of way. I don't know, that's what, at least for me, that's what helps. I don't, I don't know how everybody else's is, you know, going to work. Okay. Yeah, I, I personally have seen that confidence, it, it seems to come from competence. It seems from becoming truly good at what it is that you're doing and then being able to tie it to outcomes for others. Like, um, believe it or not, I'm terrified of public speaking for the very like, longest time. I was afraid to get it in front of an audience, right? but I kept doing it over and over and over again, I saw it as a mechanism to create value for others. So I think there's something there to become truly good at what it is that you're doing, to become excellent at your craft, I think is a good way to, to approach it. So number four um, is ask lots of questions and get the full story before you jump into problem solving mode. What does that mean? Listen, in the end, I'm a consultant, probably like a lot of you, what do you wanna do? We wanna solve problems, and especially, by the way, men. Men are terrible at this. You know, if, you're, if you're, you're married and your wife starts talking, she gets about six words out and you're like, I know, the, I know the solution. You don't even know the problem. I haven't finished. Stop, right? So we're terrible at that. And I think that goes a little bit to this, which is, you know, I've learned through my career and Dylan, especially in the people management side, go and get the full story. Uh, people tend to be pretty emotional about things, especially they're personal, they're around money, they're around career, you know, whatever it might be. Go and get more data points before you come to any kind of true solution or, or decision or whatever it might be. So gather more data, I think, is pretty key these days, and especially as men. Take that deep breath. We don't have all the answers. Um, well, we think some days we do, right? But um, I, I think it's important for us to get a little more grounded with that. Women are much better at that, by the way. So Covey has a good quote. He says, first seek to understand and then be understood. Yep. I think yeah, that's a good point. That. Number five is have conviction. You might not be right, but you can't start off doubting yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to come out with a, a change in direction, like right now we're reorganizing um, a large piece of my team that's having an effect on 
800 people's careers, I don't want to say their lives, but I, I, it's never lost on me that you do sometimes have effect on people's lives when you make big changes. But I can't, I can't make those decisions and then doubt myself all at the same time too. So when we make a decision at those kinds of levels, I go out and campaign around them, right? I'm like, oh no, we're doing this and I'm gonna try and grab as many people as I can to help back that up to say why this is gonna be good, but also to listen at the same time too if there's kind of issues in between. But we try to stay and I try to stay very convicted around any of those decisions. Conviction, okay. And the last one is this, be your authentic and genuine self. It can make tough decisions so much easier. What does that mean? Yeah. Be your authentic and genuine self. How is that not you know, a platitude? You know, uh, um, you hear authenticity is a big thing in the corporate world um, these days. There's all kinds of things in the corporate world these days. And I feel that a lot of people think it's like a destination, that you can go learn authenticity. You, you could learn some tactics, some traits. There, there's no doubt about doing that. But you can't be somebody else. You can learn from other people. But go be your best self. So play to whatever strength you might have. And I think it will work out much better for you, you know, in, in anything you might do within your career. You know, I, like, like for me, a, a comment I always get about myself when I, I do stuff like this or, you know, I got to get in front of my own team. They're always like, huh, you're just so like down to earth and authentic. And I'm like, well, yeah, because I'm like this when I go home. Now, God bless my wife because she has to deal with me like this all the time. But I don't see a difference in trying to put on that corporate persona. You see a lot of, you know, especially higher up leaders, they have these duality personas. And if you, if you were to meet them in the hallway, you'd expect them to be like they are on stage. There, there's amping energy up, don't get me wrong. You, you're always gonna see differences in that. And I would do that too. But there's quite often a lot of like um, high-end leaders that are very different one-on-one -on -one than they'll be on stage, so to speak. <clears throat> then I don't believe that they're authentic. And, and I, don't, I don't even understand that. That doesn't make, it make sense to me. Like, just be yourself, play to the strengths you have. It takes some time to go out, figure out what some of those are. I couldn't point them out to anybody. I know some of my own, but um, once you have some self-realization around that, you'll start playing to those. And, and by the way, like, like you, Julian, I was deathly afraid of public speaking for a long, long period of time. And it was when you started seeing other people doing it and I had more self-realization into the authenticity thing, I was like, well, I'm just going to go do it the way I feel like doing it, and I know it's worked out so far. And, and that's something I immediately appreciated about you when I first met you, because obviously you, you have a huge team. You're like way up on the corporate ladder, but you were so easy to talk to. Like I got a sense that who I'm talking to was the real person I was talking to. So I thought that was really cool. So, so Jeff, we're about to close out right now. So, so give us a final piece of advice. This is all about growing leadership, achieving success in your career, your best personal professional life. What's the last piece of advice you want to give our audience in attendance? Yeah. So it's a, it's a quote um, that I, I use uh, quite often. I love the mentorship one of the, you know, be endearing and be known for something. But uh, I'll give you this one uh, and then a, a kind of a quick funny story that goes along with it, which is uh, I've never had a bad day in my life. I actually don't. That doesn't even resonate with me. That doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. I've had lots of bad things happen, whatever they may be. But... Like, I don't let them affect me to the point of like, oh, this is just terrible and I'm gonna have a horrible day and everybody else around me is gonna know about it and they're all now gonna be unhappy because I'm unhappy. And it's not about just being happy, right? But I think if you can kind of internalize some of that and go, listen, things are gonna happen, you know? I could use a lot of four letter words in around that too if you want, but let them go and you'll, you'll figure out where to um, deal with it down the road. And what's kind of funny and interesting about that is my mom, I, I tell her that. She asks sometimes, you know, what, what's work like? And she can't really, you know, fathom what I do, which is fine. But I use this philosophy thing with her all the time. And she's just like, I don't understand that. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, well, where did you get that from? Because my mom is definitely that, oh, I broke my nail. And now you're going to hear about it for the next, you know, 24 hours. You're like, my God, mom, you have nine others. You'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> And, and she's that type that's like complete opposite. 
And she's like, well, we didn't teach you that. Where'd you get it from? I'm like, I have no clue. But maybe it was the fact that I saw you consternate over everything that I was like, I don't want to be like that. Um, I definitely have a, I, I don't like to worry about much. It drives my wife crazy, by the way, because I'm always like, ah, it's fine. We'll figure it out. And she's not like that at all. But maybe that's the good yin and yang that we've got. But I know, great, great uh, um, ending, hopefully, for, for you guys. So, Jeff, final question here for you. This has been amazing, by the way, and thank you for doing this. The show is called Pathways to Success. What is your personal definition of success? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people could measure it by, by monetary or this or that. Per- personally, I'm, I'm very driven by seeing other people's careers thrive um, and giving back as much as I can. It's part of why, you know, um, Collins and, and yourself contact me. Would you do that? I'm like... Yeah, why not? Like, I don't, I don't really get anything out of this per se, but helping anybody, especially by the way that our technical um, personas and the world as a whole, because, well, it has changed since the 80s where geeks were pushed to the back kind of thing. There is a definitely a geek through the world type thing going on right now. But I still think there is a, a lack of confidence by a lot of people that are in the technical space to see... Um, people that are successful at the highest levels. And I, I know from my own team, I'm trying to show to them like, yeah, you can do this too. And I promise you, I was just like you when I was 20 years ago in my career. So to me, that's a definition of success is helping you know, people achieve their own career goals and aspirations and to try to be a, you know, a bit of a shining light for the tech community as a whole. Service to others. I love it. Awesome. Jeff, this has been a tremendous conversation. Really appreciate you being on the show. Close us out, if you would. Go direct to this camera. Tell us how to connect with you, support you, learn more about you. Share with us about Yeah, no, uh, look me up on LinkedIn. I'm a, a huge uh, social media person, nothing like Julian, of course. Um, so feel free to connect. Always up for a virtual cup of coffee. Um, we'll take questions anytime. And uh, good luck, good selling, good living. Awesome. And we'll make sure to have all your contact information in the show notes as well. So I really appreciate this, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. And everyone else, thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Pathways to Success. As always, make sure to subscribe, comment, and share. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Pathways to Success.